Hello. All right. Good morning. Or, well, good morning for. Sorry about uh, that. Uh, I was having some computer trouble. How are you all? Good, good. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us on, I guess, technically a day off for us. Um, for those of you guys that we're are not. Fourth, we're having the 4th of July a day early here. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're excited to have Professor Ian Shapiro join us again. Uh, for those of you guys that didn't join us last month, um, welcome. My name is Devin Lau, and I'm the Assistant Director of Yale Center Beijing. Uh, with me is Professor Ian Shapiro, Sterling Professor of Political Science. Um, and a special welcome to everybody. Um, as Professor Shapiro mentioned, um, tomorrow is July 4th, but um, many of us in the U.S. are actually cel not celebrating, but at least taking the day off today. <laughs> um, just a quick introduction. Uh, Yale Center Beijing is a gathering place for leaders from Yale and China and the world to dialogue about pressing issues. Uh, we bring the best of Yale, uh, such as Professor Ian Shapiro, to uh, the Chinese audience in order to showcase um, all that's going on at Yale. And we're lucky that even now um, we have an opportunity to join from online so that we can actually connect more people than even before. Uh, Professor Shapiro uh, is originally from South Africa, received his JD and his PhD from Yale, uh, where, he has, <coughs> excuse me, where he has taught since 1984. Uh, and he served as chair of the political science department from 99 to 2004. He's also served as the director of the Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. And uh, his popular course, Moral Foundations of Politics, or Moral Po, is available online on Canvas, uh, as well as his latest Devane lectures on power and politics in today's world. As I mentioned, we're excited to have Professor Shapiro join us once again. Uh, today, we will be uh, talking about his uh, one of his uh, newer books, Responsible Parties, Saving Democracy from Itself. A uh, very appropriate topic to be discussing uh, as we celebrate um, the fourth. Uh, and so I guess without further ado, I will turn it over to Professor Shapiro. Thank you. Thank you all for coming uh, and for accommodating me at what's probably not the most convenient time for you. Um, what I'm planning to do today is to talk about a, a book I, I published uh, a year and a half ago with Francis Rosenbluth called Responsible Parties Saving Democracy from Itself. And it's about um, changes that have taken place in the democratic systems over the past three or four decades. And um, these are, have been in many ways difficult decades uh, economically in many of these countries in that we have had, it's been an era of uh, wage stagnation um, since the 1970s um, for many in the middle and working classes of these countries. Family incomes have often remained constant only by going from a one earner to a two earner family. This has been the era of globalization when jobs have gone offshore uh, so that all of the, what used to be thought of as the advanced industrial economies have, have become service economies. And um, even the service sector jobs increasingly went offshore in the 1990s and 2000s. And of course, uh, increasingly the jobs are not so much going offshore as going to technology, but, um, so, you know, even if you look in the service sector, in a McDonald's restaurant that uh, 10 years ago had 20 people working in it, now has six people working in it, and five years from now, there'll probably be one person watching computers make hamburgers. Um, and this, is, this has been eroding jobs uh, uh, all over, at, at, not just... Um, low income service sector jobs, but for instance, in uh, even in things like investment banking, lots of uh, jobs are being uh, taken over by uh, computers and investing through algorithms and so on. So um, if you think about, you know, 30 years ago, when you got a mortgage, you were interviewed by a qualified um, banker who has had a middle class job. Today, your mortgage application is typed into a software program by someone with a high, high school education at most. So um, 
the 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 long term story is uh, great employment insecurity, downward mobility for a lot of people, um, and even when employment unemployment numbers are low, um, that masks the fact that that people have gone from uh, better paying jobs to worse paying jobs, from higher status jobs to lower status jobs. So uh, that's the background, and I talked more about that in the last lecture I gave and policies that might address it. What I'm going to talk, to do, talk about today is the effect of all of this on democratic politics within the older democracies in particular, uh, although our book also deals with we we have chapters on Britain, France, Germany, um, um, but, uh, Japan, but we also have chapters on the East European newer democracies and on the Latin American democracies. Um, but the, the basic background point for this discussion is that there has been a lot of um, anxiety, alienation, dissatisfaction, uh, and therefore declining um, legitimacy attaching to the political systems of these countries. Because when, when people feel their lives are not going well, they want to blame someone and they naturally uh, reach for the people who are running the country. They naturally reach to blame the political system. Our system must be broken. There's something wrong with it. Uh, we need to reform it. And so, um, there has been a lot of efforts to reform political systems. And the message of our book is that most of the attempts to reform these systems have made things worse. Um, so I, what I thought I would do is split my talk into two parts. Um, we're gonna, I'm first going to talk about two-party systems versus multiple-party systems. So. Britain and the U.S., and for example, being typical two-party systems, and then most of the West European countries, multiple-party systems. And then maybe I will pause and we can have some conversation about that. Um, and then I will talk about countries with strong parties versus countries with weak parties. And I'll explain what I mean by the difference between strong parties and weak parties and why, why we have had a tendency over the last several decades to greatly weaken political parties and what the implications of that have been. So let's, so let's start with two-party systems and uh, multiple-party systems. And um, so the conventional wisdom used to be that m the multi-party systems you get in Europe are both fairer and more representative on the one hand, and also produce better policy on the other hand. And so the idea that they are fairer and more representative is that, well, you know, in a two-party system, many people's preferences are not represented. Um, so if you, you know, if you're an environmentalist and you favor the Greens, um, in a multi-party system, there'll be a green party, and you can support the green party. In a two-party system, there won't be a green party. Um, and so uh, in a multi-party system, you get parties across the ideological spectrum, and everybody can find a party that's closer to their political views than in a two-party system. And so the conventional wisdom was this is, is more representative, um, and that's fairer. And then it was also often noted that um, multi-party systems tend to produce policies that are better for the median voter, for most people. So, for example, um, Britain, and if I, had, if I had some slides with me, I would be able to show you that countries like Britain and the U.S. have more inequality than countries in Western Europe. Um, the, the, um, uh, generally speaking, um, European countries have been thought to, to have, to be more redistributive, to have better social safety nets, to have better retraining programs for people who've lost their jobs, a topic I talked about last time, and so on. Um, so, uh, 
that is that historically was the case, but uh, we argue that that all depended upon a state of affairs that has since gone away. What it all depended upon was um, a powerful left of center party that was um, backed up by organized labor. So the, S, the SPD in Germany, for example, would be a typical case, but it, in, in all of the West European countries, um, you had uh, a very big, powerful left of center party that was typically uh, in government much of the time and um, made uh, agree coalitions, if you like, with the, the right of center big business party. Some, sometimes people call this liberal corporatism. The idea being um, that, uh, you know, organized labor wants uh, job security for its members. It wants wage stability. Business wants not to have strikes. Um, so they would make these big deals and sort of sanctify them through the political system. What we have seen, though, um, in the bigger economy of all these countries is the collapse of organized labor for the reasons I talked about before, um, uh, jobs first going offshore and jobs going to the service sector, which are hard to unionize, and then jobs going to technology. So in every advanced industrial country, the, the unionized labor force has gone from you know, close to half in the 1950s to uh, in the U.S. it's single digits now. But in all of the West European countries, organized labor has become much weaker and therefore less able to defend its members through the political system. So uh, they've cut less good deals with the, the right of center parties and they represent fewer workers. Uh, so so there are m many people who now work that are not represented by these parties. And what you've seen happen is the fragmentation of parties in the political system as a result. So again, just to stick with the German example, but it's happened in, in all of these countries, um, the SPD has hemorrhaged uh, voters to the Greens, to the far left Der Linke party, to some to the CDU, and some to the far right anti-immigrant alternative for Deutschland party. And so you get a situation in all of these countries where the, the big left of center party that used to come in pretty much all the time, first or second in elections, now comes in you know fourth or fifth or sixth um, and has, has uh, to compete with other uh, parties uh, for votes. And so the, the left of center parties have become um, much less able uh, to defend the interests of workers and less effective at it. And so again, I don't want to belabor Germany, but since it's the case on, on the table, it was, it was actually the SPD and the Greens who came in in the early 2000s in a coalition who put in the Hartz reforms, which were kind of neoliberal reforms, not very friendly to labor in a desperate attempt to hang on to power. Um, so the, the two-party, multi-party story looks very different today because it's far from clear that multi-party systems any longer have the capacity to deliver um, what's uh, good for most workers. Um, there's also a, a point to make, and then I'll, I'll stop and we can go to conversation, but there's a point to make about the fairness um, of these systems being better than what you get in two-party systems. So it's true at the electoral stage that everybody can vote for a party that's closer to their preferences, but the problem is you still have to form a government after that. And um, that means you have to have a deal made. And uh, 
the voter doesn't know at the time of the election what deal is going to be made between their party, if it's going to be in government, and which other parties. So after the last, in the 2017 German elections, for example, Merkel spent seven months trying to put together a coalition between the right of center, Hearst's right of center, CDU, the Greens, and the libertarian um, Free Democrat. She couldn't do that in the end, and so she persuaded the SPD to go back into a grand coalition. Um, if she had been able to do that, the first thing she was trying to do, we'd have had a very different government in Germany today. So while it's true at the electoral stage that, that multi-party systems are more representative, that doesn't mean that um, you get more representative governments. we we'll say in Israel, uh, the governments are all formed of parties on the very far right, again, a very fragmented political system. Um, so the voter doesn't know who, who their party is going to make a deal with, what compromises they're going to have to make in order to make that deal, and there's less accountability later because they can, say, they can blame their um, coalition partners and so on. So um, one of the things we argue in our book is that for these reasons, uh, the, the, what, would, what have typically been thought of as the advantages of multi-party systems have really gone away. And uh, voters are actually better off where there are a smaller number of parties where politicians have to campaign on the policies they're going to imp implement um, if they get elected and can be held to account for what they're doing uh, or have done later. So why don't, why don't we stop there and um, people can uh, um, chime in uh, with some observations or questions or comments, and then we can, we can go back and talk about weak and strong parties. Great. Yeah, so as Professor Shapiro mentioned, uh, if you have any comments or questions uh, regarding what we've discussed so far, um, feel free to use the chat function on the bottom of your screen, uh, as well as the raise hand function under the participants tab. Either of those would work, um, and we'll be happy to call on you and um, have some discussion. So I see a hand up already um, with um, Yang. Let's see. Okay. Hand up. Ideally, if people could turn on the cameras when they're talking, but I know that's not possible for some of you. Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, Professor. Uh, as a matter of fact, I don't think America is a two-party per se. Mm, take KKK for KKK, K, yeah, for example. And... Uh, mm, uh, just, just as you said, that um, science and technology, uh, science and technology, largely defines the kind of relations we have, and uh, there, of course, there is vice versa. Uh, so, uh, uh, the also it uh, also it affects um, knowledge production. So. Um, uh, because I have noticed that uh, in foreign affairs, that uh, there are also a lot of uh, controversies in the recent uh, military spendings of uh, China. And uh, so, um, but yeah, I think that might be somewhat uh, related to what you are going to talk about later, but uh, uh, there are also some cases that uh, in many circumstances with the natural disasters and etc., uh, most uh, responsibilities are put into uh, heavy burdens of the PLA. So. Mm, I don't know if you have any comment on those topics. Uh, well, I think you were right when you said that your comments are mostly re 
about that they're mostly relevant to what I was I'm going to talk about next, which is the difference between weak and strong parties. There are many many um, bad features of the U.S. political system, but our argument in the book is it's not that it's a two-party system; it's that the, the American parties are very weak, and this makes it extremely difficult for them to govern. It means they're easily uh, taken over by uh, hostile groups, um, and it's very difficult for them uh, to to engage in effective policy. But why don't we just defer that until uh, the second half when I talk about weak versus strong parties. Okay. Great, thanks. Uh, Gavin, do you still have a question? Oh, thank you, Devin. Good morning, Professor Shapiro. Uh, I think I would just uh, delay my uh, question after Professor Shapiro finishes his presentation on the second part. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, you, uh, Professor Shapiro, do you see that there's a question from Vivian? Uh, yeah, it's from Vivian. Yeah. So he's, what are the conditions for democracy to work? Uh, Multi-party systems are not needed. Um, and they don't necessarily depend on the level of education. Most of, you know, what the conventional scholarship tells us now is that, that the most important conditions for democracy to work are economic. Um, what you need is um, not extreme poverty. You need a per capita, uh, if, if per capita income falls below about $14,020 $20 a year, democracy starts to become vulnerable. Um, and the further it falls, the more vulnerable democracy comes. It's not an iron law. You do have democracy surviving in, say, in India, but that's very much an outlier. Uh, for the most part, uh, it, democracy does not do well in very poor countries. It's also very important to have a diversified economy, not just per capita income. Uh, this is the so-called oil curse problem. Um, so the oil curse is bad for the economy, but it's also bad for democratic systems because if basically if a country is completely dependent on one sector uh, for its survival, then whoever has access to the, that sector is not going to want to give up power if they lose an election and they're going to grab power if they can grab it. Um, and so this is why democracy is very vulnerable in, in countries that don't have diversified economies, because the costs of giving up power are too big. And for democracy to work, you really need it to be the case that when somebody loses an election, they'll walk away and they won't send the tanks down uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. And that means there've got to be other ways they can go and be successful, the other ways they can make money, and so on. So that's what the oil curse means for politics. So I'd say the three most important variables, one is per capita income, second is a diversified economy, and third is not downward mobility. Um, we know from behavioral economics now, we know from Kahneman and Kursky's um, Nobel Prize winning work about loss aversion, that when things get, that losing things, it, is much more potent for people than not gaining things. And so if you have uh, what I described to you at the beginning of my talk today, if you have downward mobility or if you have um, people expecting to have worse jobs in the future or expecting their children to have worse jobs, this is going to make them very angry. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make them blame the political system and it's going to make it much easier for uh, populists and demagogues to mobilize them against the political system. Uh, and this is what we see with somebody like Trump in the U.S. It's what we see with the emergence of the anti-system parties in Europe. Uh, they are essentially mobilizing people who have faced uh, and are continuing to face long-term losses. So I think those are the three big things for democracy, per capita income, diversified economy, and uh, not downward mobility for the middle class and working class populations. Yeah, absence of that. Very interesting. Um, 
Catherine has a question. Um, what are the common points between two parties and multiple parties? What separates them from each other? Okay, so the, the difference, the, di the main difference, I would say, comes down to this. Um, in a multi-party system, the negotiations between the parties that are going to form the government take place after the election. And in two-party system, they basically take away taking place before because you're putting together a big tent party in a two-party system. Um, you might think that sounds like a trivial difference, you know, what, what's the big deal? So one time, one, one case you make the, have the negotiations before and one case you have the negotiations after. But um, the, this, is, this is what it comes down to. Um, in a multi-party system, Let's suppose you're going to have a coalition between a big business party and a big labor party. The business party doesn't want strikes. They want industrial stability. They want predictability. The labor party wants wage stability and protections for their members. So they may make that deal at the cost, say, of externalizing uh, the cost of their deal onto others, say, in the form of higher prices, so inflation. Or if you think about a, a, an agrarian party, what's it going to want out of a coalition? It's going to want protections for farmers. Um, and again, that might come at the cost of higher food prices, right, uh, for, for people not in the coalition. So when you, when you think about you're putting together a coalition government, you're going to externalize the cost of your deal onto people not in the coalition. And you don't worry about the future because you, in the future you might be in a coalition with somebody else, right? You don't, you don't think about the longer term, right? So if you like, coalition governments are like hookups. When two-party systems, they're more like marriages, right? In coalition, this is good for me right now, but who knows about the future, right? Uh, but when you're putting together the platform in, in, for a party in a two-party system, it's, you have a different problem because you know it, that if if your party doesn't win, the other party's going to win. Your party's not the government, the other party's going to be the government. So when you put together that pre-election coalition, you want to leave as few voters on the table as possible. Because if you leave that one marginal voter you leave on the table might be the voter that causes you to lose the election rather than uh, win the election, right? So you have an incentive to internalize the cost of your deals as much as possible so as not to leave voters on the table that the other party's going to get, right? So how do you do that? So the way you do it is um, you, you discount everything you propose by everything else you propose. So let, let me explain what I mean by this. Um, if you ask American voters, um, would you like a tax cut? 70% will say yes. Any tax cut, even um, the estate tax, which is paid by you know less than 2% of the population, most of it's paid by half of 1%, estates over $20 million. Almost nobody pays this tax. You can, you can get 70% to say yes, we should get rid of it. But if you say, should we get rid of the estate tax if it also means getting rid of prescription drug benefits for senior citizens, then they'll say, no. So what's going on there? In the second case, they're discounting their preference for a tax cut by their preference for not getting rid of prescription drug benefits for seniors. That's what I mean, right? So, um, so in a, in a in a two-party system, when you put together that program you, you, that you're going to run on, you have to discount everything you propose by everything else you propose in a way that you hope will appeal to more voters than the other party that's doing the same thing, right? So that's the basic logic um, of uh, the difference between um, uh, two-party systems and multi-party systems. In a multi-party system, if you're if you're the Green Party, you're just going to run on green regulation, and you say we're going to push for as much green regulation as possible. That's all we're going to do, 
right? Or if you're the anti-immigrant party, you're going to say, we're just going to push for stopping immigration. That's all we're going to do. Um, and uh, voters are not going to actually know what's going to happen once the deals are finally made um, and who's going to bear the cost of those deals. So this is another sense in which the basic logic of, of uh, having two parties competing differs from the logic of, of multi-party systems. Great. Uh, do you want to use that as a jumping off point to go into your second uh, part of the lecture? So how are we doing for time? Yeah, we've got about 25 minutes, right? Yeah. Um, so I said at the beginning that when, when things are not going well for people, they want somebody to blame. And there'll always be politicians who'll come along and mobilize people and say, you know, it's it's the immigrants' fault, it's the bankers' fault, it's the politicians' fault, it's the political system's fault. So vote for me, and I I alone can fix it, as you know, as Trump said the last time through. Um, so uh, one of the things that's been going on, in, and this has been going on in all of the advanced democracies. Uh, basically since the 1970s, is there have been demands to reform the political systems by making them more internally democratic, um, having more uh, direct voter control of parties, of platforms, of politicians, of leadership selection, of candidate selection, um, through mechanisms like primary elections uh, within parties in the U.S., um, by having direct election of party leaders, and so on. And the, I, I could talk in some detail about a couple of these, but the, the main point is what this has done has made it more difficult for parties to govern um, because they are much more beholden to all of the different groups that have a say in their governance in the name of more democracy but in fact, it produces a situation where parties are often controlled by fringe groups uh, on the extremes of the parties or by uh, people who contribute money to parties. And so it makes, so the, the paradox is people feel more and more out of control of their lives and their, their politics. They demand more and more uh, uh, direct say in governance, but in fact, that produces even worse governance that solves their problem even less well. So that, that's the, you know, the reforms we've had have been um, uh, sort of like bloodletting. Um, and the, so we basically have made our parties worse. Um, so just to give you a couple of examples, um, primaries. Uh, primary elections in the U.S., uh, were not important in the presidential elections until after the reforms of the 1970s, so-called McGovern-Fraser reforms in the U.S. Um, in, in the Democratic Party, uh, after the disastrous 1968 convention in Chicago, big, big reform of the party, uh, much more attention to internal democracy, much more attention to primaries, and then the Republicans copied them. But here's the problem with primaries. You, in primaries, you have very low turnout, usually. Um, and who turns out when the turnout is low? The activists on the extremes of the parties turn out. Uh, so the people who show up and vote in primaries are not the people. They're not the median voter in the district, never mind the median voter in the country. Um, and so, uh, so, for instance, Trump was picked as the Republican candidate in 2016 by less than 5% of the U.S. electorate, an extremely low turnout primaries. Um, the same thing is true in, in Congress. Uh, in Congress, we've had primaries for more than 100 years. They came with the progressive, in the progressive era in the early 20th century. But what's changed in recent decades is we've got more and more and more safe seats seats that are clearly going to be Democrat or Republican, uh, and everybody knows it uh, for a variety of reasons. We've got more and more and more safe seats. But of course, once you have a safe seat, 
the only election that matters is the primary election. Um, and so what tends, and this is one big explanation for why, a big part of the explanation for why American politics has become more polarized, because the the people who get picked in the primaries are, are, are by the activists toward the fringes of the parties. Um, and so they, they uh, then have to be responsive to the, the activists who will, who will run a, a primary challenger against them if they're not, right, if they're not responsive. But so what happens when they get to Washington, um, either they make compromises to pass legislation, which you have to do in the American system, uh, and, and then they are accused of selling out and so forth by the people who elected them. Or they don't, and then you get gridlock, and you don't get any, this goes to the first question, you can't get coherent policies enacted. And so, I mean, just one illustration of this, when the Republicans were in opposition before 2016, they voted 71 times to get rid of the Obamacare, Affordable Care Act. Once they were in government, they couldn't get rid of it. They couldn't um, because the the leadership couldn't get the um, the representatives to agree on a policy of what they were in favor of to replace it. Um, so this is a kind of dysfunction you get when the parties are controlled by their fringes. I'll give you another one other example. And another big and. The increased use of primaries has gone on in many countries, but an, another example is direct election of party leaders. So I'll take an election, an example from the UK. Um, it used to be the case that um, the leader of a party was chosen by the, par the parliamentary party, the members of parliament in that party. So the Labour Party MPs chose the Labour Party leader and the Conservative Party MPs chose the Conservative Party leader. And of course, they would pick someone who they were happy to delegate authority to because they wanted it to be a winning team, right? So you, you pick a leader who that you know will lead you in a way that's going to be good, uh, right? Uh, for your party uh, that's going to get you reelected in your district and is hopefully going to get your party reelected as the government. So everybody's going to be operating on one team. Where we've gone in most of these countries now is the direct election of leaders by the membership. So just to take one example, the Labour Party in the UK uh, has about 450,000 members. Um, you can become a, part, a member of the Labour Party by paying three pounds. Um, so not surprisingly, the membership are activists, they're sort of like primary voters in the US, and they pick somebody like Jeremy Corbyn in uh, 2015. Jeremy Corbyn is a card-carrying Marxist way to the left of your typical Labour voter, never mind your typical British voter. So what, what happened? The Labour Party in Parliament quickly discovered they couldn't work with Corbyn um, because if they followed through on his program, they wouldn't get reelected in their constituencies because they, he's far to the left of the voters in their constituencies. Um, so they had a vote uh, the following year, I think it was 100 and, 172 to 40, no confidence vote in Corbyn. Three months later, he was re-elected by the membership with an even bigger majority, 62% majority, right? So uh, he, so he, there he is, uh, lots of legitimacy. I've been elected by 450,000 Labour Party members, but he's trying to lead this party in Parliament that can't work with him. And so, of course, he led them. He he insisted on a in, in 2019, an extremely le far left uh, manifesto. Um, they had they had called the, in 1984 Michael Foote's manifesto the longest suicide note in history. It was also a case where the far left got control of the Labour Party. But uh, 
uh, Corbyn's was even longer and produced an even bigger disaster for the party. So this is again, just one example, but in country after country after country, we've been moving in the direction of direct election of leaders. Again, it's, it's the claim is it's more democratic, uh, but it, just like primary elections, has the effect of making the political parties in the legislature dysfunctional, impossible to lead, impossible to govern with, um, and um, produces backbench rebellions where the, the parliamentary party won't support what the leadership wants. Uh, similar things have gone on in the conservative party, which I could talk about if people are interested in. So those are just two examples, and we describe many more in the book of the ways in which um, this satisfaction has led to reforms which weaken political parties, but then produce even more dysfunctional politics than we had before. Why don't I stop there and take some questions? Yeah. Great. Um, so again, if you have questions, feel free to write in the chat box or raise your hand. Uh, the first one comes from uh, Gui Gui Yao. Go ahead. Oh, the media. Yes, the question about media. Yeah, so I can see the question. Don't the okay. media control everything? That's the question. Um, so the, 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 that is a big problem, and it's, it's mostly due to the changing technological character of the media. Um, you know, 40 years ago, everybody watched the same 6.30 p.m. news, ABC, NBC, or CBS. People were having the same conversation. And all political views were argued about uh, in the same forum. We now live in a world of extremely segmented media markets. So first we got cable television, so that, that started it. Then we got satellite television. Now we have social media. So, uh, you know, when you talk to people like yourself, you tend to become more extreme. Uh, and so the, the changing character of media markets certainly makes it much more difficult for politicians to build broad coalitions and, and uh, appeal to uh, cross sections of voters. I would just add that um, the media issue is closely connected to the matter of money in politics. And, uh, you know, because you need a lot of money to buy a lot of media and um, money is also more important in weak systems because in a, in a basically because retail campaigning is much more expensive than wholesale campaigning. If you have a strong party or campaigning on one platform, you don't need a lot of money for retail campaigning to buy me, big media buys and so forth. But when every person is campaigning for themselves, they need a lot of money. And then uh, not only do they need money to get by the media, they're then susceptible to being controlled by the people who gave them the money. So it's another, an, another insidious problem that's made worse when you have weak parties. Great. Um, Gavin, do you want to go ahead and ask your question this time? Uh, yeah, thank you, Devin. Uh, good morning, Professor Shapiro. Good to see you again. Well, actually, when I first read your book last year, I was so inspired by the argument that you and Professor Rosen both advanced that it uh, prompted me to go to Taiwan last summer. And I did a research uh, in Taiwan, just trying to figure out like to what extent are the two main parties in Taiwan, can they be considered as responsible parties? And what I found out was that, you know, to a great extent, I think they can fit into the category of being responsible uh, in terms of uh, members are elected from the single member district. They are large diverse district, no issue of gerrymandering whatsoever uh, in Taiwan. And then you have uh, relatively uh, disciplined parties. And also there has been what they call, uh, what you uh, so-called the party council in terms of uh, there has been a national local uh, coordination for coherent party platforms. But the uh, one puzzle that I found emerged is that 70% uh, of the voters according to a survey say that neither of the parties understand the need of average citizens. And I think one potential explanation for that, and if you look at it from a broader scope, if you look at all the East Asian democracies, countries like Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea, you will find that there isn't a typical 
uh, left right dimensions as uh, compared to those parties in uh, Western Europe. And the problem with that is uh, the parties, including parties in Taiwan, that becomes fle flexible and uh, opportunistic on um, issues regarding uh, welfare and uh, economic policies, environmental policies. And so you have basically have Japan, the chapter in the book talking about Japan, that you have the basically the right wing parties, quote, um, adopted the traditional left wing policy of, uh, of physical and monetary expansion to combat the uh, post bubble deflation. So you have this uh, weird dynamic of, you know, part that there are mainly two parties in South Korea, but the most salient political issue is the relationship with the with North, North Korea and you have Japan mostly related to the issue with uh, regarding their constitution revision and you have Taiwan with their most concern is their relationship with mainland China so how to explain uh, the dynamic uh, the dynamic here in East Asian democracies thank you well so that's that's a, it's a very good question um, so what what you, you know Dubois law tells you that if you have single member, Duvajay's du du law is just for people that don't know what it is. Basically it says the, the, um, the number of parties you get will depend on uh, uh, the electoral system in particular, um, what they call it, the number of, the number of people elected in a constituency plus one. So if you have single member districts, you're going to end up with two parties. It, it, assumes, it assumes that the districts are more or less like one another, um, so that the median voter in the district is more or less like the median voter in every other district. If that's not true, say in India, where you have big regional variation, uh, you can have single member districts and you won't, you'll get, you'll still get more parties. Uh, in Canada, you've got, you'll get the, you know, you've got the Quebecois, so it, it is it but so putting that aside, okay. So um but it doesn't tell you what the dimension will be um a, a, along which the competition occurs between the two parties, right? And you know, as I said at the beginning of the talk, the the big structural change in all of these economies is by the collapse in the power of or, organized labor. And the move of all politics to what we used to think of as the right. So whether it was, you know, uh, and this is this has been two party systems, multi party systems. So, you know, we in two party systems, we got the new Democrats and new labor, new Democrats in the US and new labor in uh, the UK, new labor, you know, just carried on with Margaret Thatcher's agenda, of privatization, deregulation or, or um, free trade. And the same thing with the New Democrats. So they were moving to the right because the nature of politics had been changing and people, uh, you know, on the old left or uh, both the parties are now right wing, uh, they're not serving us. But the same thing happened in the multi-party systems. I, I told you that it was not, it was not the CDU that put the hearts reforms in Germany. It was it was a coalition of the SPD and the Greens, you know. And again, basically neoliberal pro-market uh, reforms. So, so that's the big thing that's been going on. Uh, and and the fact that you might therefore start to get a different axis of political competition uh, it isn't a surprise. All, all that all the electoral system is going to tell you is it, 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 you'll have uh, you'll have two parties competing, but they may not necessarily compete over what we used to think of as left right issues. They could compete over over other issues. Um, they could compete over, you know, uh, I mean, in Western Europe, maybe the, the new axis of competition is going to be all about um, immigration. Uh, you know, you, you just, you don't know what it's going to be. Um, I personally think it's better for politics when they compete over economic questions than over identity questions. But, but, you know, that's going to, that's my, that's just my preference. You can't, you know, so there's no, there's no prediction that the continuum is going to be um, the old left, right continuum. Great. Um, there's 
quite a few good questions. Um, so Philip W here um, asks, what are your thoughts on a ranking based election system in which voters can select or rank more than one candidate on a multi candidate can uh, multi candidate ballot as well as the follow up of should we just get rid of US primaries altogether? Uh, so Ranked choice voting is, is uh, we don't like it because it keeps small parties alive, basically. It's it just like um, having multiple rounds. So like in France, they have single member district systems. You would predict two parties. Why have they got more parties? Because they have multiple rounds and that keeps the small parties alive. They run in the first round, hoping to extract rents from the bigger parties in, in return for supporting them in the next round. Ranked choice voting is the same. Um, so you, you know, we want we want to force we want to force people to uh, think about their preferences uh, in a way that makes them discount them by other things that they want as well. As I, going back to what I said before, uh, we want we want coalitions to internalize the cost of their deals rather than externalize them. So uh, we don't, even though it sounds fairer, we think ranked choice voting wouldn't be good. Um, getting rid of primaries, um, I personally think it would be great to get rid of primaries, but I think it's impossible uh, in the US that certainly in the Congress that have been around now for 120 years, they're kind of baked in so what we argue in the book instead is, which I think is more politically realistic, is that most people don't realize that the primary turnout is so low. You know, when I give this talk and I tell people that Trump was picked by 5% of the U.S. electorate, people are completely shocked by that. No, people, it's not common knowledge. So what we, we suggest as a better reform is um, to say that if, if the primary turnout falls below 75% of the general election turnout in the previous two elections, say, then it should be discounted and the party leadership should pick the candidate. Um, so we, you know, we, we would de we're trying to de-emphasize the importance of primaries. By the way, just if you want the history of this, in the U.S., the congressional parties used to pick the presidential candidates. They called it a congressional caucus. Um, and so it operated more like a parliamentary system. And what happened was in, in 1824, Andrew Jackson didn't get picked and he was so angry that he mounted the first populist attack on the system. He said, this is the elites protecting themselves. We need a reform. Um, and he pushed, and they, that's the, in 1832, they got their first conventions. Um, and that was the beginning of the decentralization of selection. So we would, you know, but within the constraints of the US system without, um, without constitutional amendments and things like that, which on, you know, life's too short, uh, we were trying to propose things that can be done short of that. It would be much better to say if if the primary turnout falls below some threshold, then the congressional parties should pick the candidates, which would make the American system function more like a parliamentary system. Okay, uh, I'm gonna jump to Cher since um, Cher hasn't gotten a question in before. Um, and the question is, basically uh, dealing with political correctness and the effect of um, PC culture on the extent of freedom of speech and therefore democracy. Um, I think there's always been political correctness to some extent. Uh, the more politics revolves around identity issues, the more political correctness I think rears its head if you so um you know what what i would argue now say um for de the the democrat you know we have a um we, we're running short of time maybe i'll just we finish with this maybe i would just say um 
1964, we had the Civil Rights Act, and then in 1965, we had the Voting Rights Act. Uh, it was, um, it was uh, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, there was huge backlash against that in the South, and Richard Nixon realized that created an opportunity. Um, and this is called Nixon's Southern Strategy by starting to uh, politicize, uh, you know, the reaction against the political correctness of the civil rights movement in the South. And that was hugely effective. It produced eventually, you know, Nixon's Southern Strategy, which was to uh, pull the, the white working class Southerners away from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party worked for Nixon. It created what eventually was called Reagan Democrats and now Trump Democrats. Um, and it's all about identity politics. And the Democrats have played into that by talking less about melting pot and more about multiculturalism, more about identity politics. Um, but what we, it, you know, you, a book you guys should talk about, and you might want to see if you can get the author to come, is this um, Case, uh, uh, Anne Case and Angus Deaton book, Deaths of Despair, which basically says that the downward mobility in the working class whites, whites without a college degree population, um, that's been going on for the last 30 years, is similar to what happened to African Americans in the previous 30 years. And so uh, that's produced increased suicide rates, economic despair, um, and so on. The Democrats should be seeing that this creates an opportunity to put together the coalition that was pulled apart by Nixon's Southern strategy by campaigning on things that would be good for poorer whites and African Americans, rather than playing into talking about reparations and police reform and uh, all these issues which are uh, actually a gift to to the far right because they ramp up identity politics and uh, the politics of political correctness. So that would be what I would say about that. But I guess we're out of time. Yes. Well, do you, would would you mind answering one more question or? I'm afraid I can't because I'm okay. I'm late for the next thing I have to do. Yeah. Okay. Not a problem then. Well, thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, it was two wonderful, uh, very in-depth talks. Uh, I'm going to unmute everybody so they can say thank you. And if people are willing, please turn on your videos so we can take a group picture. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.